Great. Hello and welcome everyone to the Abbey Museum's virtual programming while it, um, featuring uh, Indigenous methodologies. Um, we're really happy to have you here for our final presentation of the year as part of this series. And this program was really developed as a way to highlight and um, uh, feature Native scholars in a, uh, and experts in a number of different fields. And today we're really lucky to have Chris Sokalexis with us uh, to do a program. And I'm really pleased to introduce him. Chris Sokalexis is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Penobscot Nation. He has an archeology span degree from the University of Maine, where he focused on archeology span in his own home territory and throughout the state of Maine. He is also involved in cultural tourism uh, initiatives in his department at the Penobscot Nation and has worked hard at incorporating uh, the knowledge of archaeology into this work. I invite all the attendees to submit questions using the Q&A box. Uh, we set aside some time at the end of the program to take questions, so I'll come back on screen and help moderate those questions. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being here to talk about Penobscot archaeology. I'm going to be turning off my camera and my mic and you can take it away, but thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like Star says, I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Penobscot Nation, and today I'm going to run through uh, a brief history. Um, my running joke is I do 12,000 years in 45 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, Maine archaeology, um, <clears throat> more specifically within the uh, traditional Penobscot homeland territories. Um, and in the end, I will, at the end of the, <clears throat> excuse me, presentation, I will focus on um, the work that I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, doing with the National Park Service with the newly created um, National Monument up in Katahdin Woods and Waters. Um, so if it'll go with me. Uh oh, that's not a way to do it. All right, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> So our traditional home, homeland territory for here um, with us, um, you know, with the Penobscot Nation, as well as the Wabanaki communities uh, that surround Katahdin. Katahdin is very sacred to us. You know, it's, it's uh, a centerpiece for a lot of spirituality and traditions for uh, <clears throat> Wabanaki people. So within our traditional territories, uh, we have a, a legend. I won't go too deeply into it, but we do have a legend where Gluskabe, like our cultural uh, icon and our teacher, um, slays the giant frog monster, which in turn creates the Penobscot River watershed um, going up through the main stem, East Branch, West Branch, Penobscot Rivers, into Moosehead Lake, and all the tributaries that come in. Um, so uh, it's short uh, story of it, Gluskabe slays the frog monster with, with a tree and breaks the frog's back, releasing all the water. And, uh, you know, people were jumping into the water, rejoicing, <clears throat> excuse me, and a lot of those people became what we know today as our water clans jumping in. And as you, as you can see, the tributary map on the right um, resembles, you know, like a, a tree with all its leaves, its, uh, stems and branches uh, which uh, make up the tributaries uh, within the Penobscot Water Rivershed. <clears throat> we have some significant uh, other places in our territories um, that stem from creation stories. So one of my favorites, um, as well as uh, my, my father's, one of his favorites was the tale of Guscabi hunting the giant moose um, over in, <clears throat> excuse me, the Moosehead Lake area and extending all the way down into Penobscot Bay where this this creation story takes place and it's an important source of Penobscot place names you know uh you know our our place in the landscape according to uh various aspects of the of the story and legend itself um but a lot of it is very um factual so if you visit these places you can see um uh, these specific areas that we are uh, 
are talking about. And uh, my father did some a lot of research back in the 80s up until uh, 2007, where he was working with the petroglyphs uh, in the Kennebec River, um, you know, doing his interpretive analysis of these images. And um, a lot of these images in this bedrock in the Kennebec River are really important to uh, one, Penobscot place names, landscapes, um, but our creation stories themselves. And this is uh, one that he interpreted from the rock um, stemming from one of our creation stories. So Gluskabe is in the, I'll call it real brief, um, Gluskabe is in the Moosehead Lake region um, hunting and a giant cow moose and her calf approach him. Um, so in his excitement, you know, he reaches down, grabs a rock, fashions it uh, into a spearhead and slays the giant cow moose. And instantly that cow moose turns into what we know today as Mount Kineo. And Mount Kineo is a very important source for, for rhyolite, um, for making stone tools for, for thousands and thousands of years. Our ancestors, I mean, coming to this uh, place to harvest the tools, um, I like to say, harvesting the tools from the belly of the moose. Um, that's where I harvest them every year when I go out to, to collect the stones for flint napping when I do demonstrations. I go to the belly of the moose. Um, there's a talus pile right in the center, <clears throat> excuse me, of the moose. And then there's another talus slope on the opposite side, on the back side of the mountain itself. Um, I really like this image, uh, this angle, because if you look at it from right to left, it looks like a, a cow moose laying down. You can see the frontal snout, the top of the head going into the shoulder hump, and then the body lays down into Moosehead Lake itself. And that talus slope on either side is right in the center of the mountain. So those, uh, that's the belly of the moose. And this is a very important, again, the lithic source, and it's found in the majority of archeological sites throughout the Northeast, sp specifically here in Maine. Um, this is a really highly regarded um, stone. It's, it's a really strong, strong stone. It's hard to work. Um, it's very challenging to make uh, spearheads and arrowheads and knives um, out, of, out of this stone. So, you know, our ancestors were very, very talented. So when I flint nap, um, I always describe it as the art of making stone tools because to me, it is an art. It's, it's challenging. Um, and the finished products are just beautiful. You know, this is just a beautiful stone. So going back to, you know, so we do have these, these petroglyphs here in the Kennebec River um, that do tell of creation stories. You know, we have the giant moose, um, we have mother earth symbols, a lot of canoes with Gluskabe traveling with his companions, um, both the dog and the pileated woodpecker. As he's going through his travels, clearing the landscape, getting ready for what they call the coming of the red man. So that's, that's us, um, where he challenges, you know, he defeats a mammoth, he defeats a giant moose, he defeats a giant serpent, um, and then brings those teachings to, you know, our early ancestors and to us today, you know, um, we still revere um, all these stories. Um, I'm a firm believer in all these, you know, these origin creation stories. Um, and a firm believer of uh, the interpretive analysis that uh, my father did, which I am continuing on today um, with his research and just continuing on into, into today's, uh, you know, up, up, upgrading and updating his, his information as well. And again, canoes are a big part of Penobscot life. You know, we're riverine people. Um, it, we depend on canoes. We've always depended on canoes. Um, we don't have any definitive dates on when, you know, the dugouts first arrived um, or when the introduction to birch bark canoe making arrived. But with, with our ancestral petroglyphs, you can tell they were just highly, highly significant and we utilize them on a daily basis. And these here represent, um, as my dad interpreted, you know, hunting expeditions, um, Luscabe on the left um, paddling away. Um, this is a real important piece for me. This is one of my favorite images uh, where Gluskabe, you know, after his teachings are done um, and the land is cleared of all obstacles, you know, he says, I got to paddle north um, and I will come back in, in a time of need. 
So if you look at, you know, think outside the box a little bit, that lower image on the left is uh, Gluscati paddling away. So if you look at someone paddling away from you, it looks just like that. You're taking a 2D image and putting it 3D, you know, in your mind's eye. And it, and it is paddling north away from you. And when you're standing on the bedrock itself, looking at the image and you look up, up, you're looking up river. So he's, uh, we looked at it as he's paddling up the Kennebec River um, away from, away from our uh, ancestral villages. Oh, and here it is here. So I just put this together. Um, this is one of our tribal members paddling a birch bark canoe, trying to replicate that image of someone paddling away from you uh, and how that would look. So our ancestors have uh, been in our landscape. We, we have, you know, a number of uh, other stories and legends where, you know, we lived along the ice margins. Um, you know, hunting these large megafauna, these large game animals, um, including mammoth, caribou, um, giant moose. And then we also have, you know, during the glaciation, after the glaciers leave, the, the ocean followed up in because the land was depressed. So we also have um, origin stories of living along an ancient ocean. And that ocean extended up as far into as Millinocket, and heading over into Moosehead Lake region. So after deglaciation, the land was pressed, ocean came right up following the glaciers. And then we get to a low stand uh, later on, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'll, that I'll briefly discuss as well in through here. Um, so our ancestors were very nomadic at this time, living in this tundra type atmosphere, um, following herds. There were no real um, large village settlements. Um, when they heard of game moved, so did the family kin units moved as well. Um, and it's hard to determine how large or small the kin groups were um, because there's really no housing structures. You're, you're only getting um, small fire hearths with, um, you know, calcine burned bone and stone tools. And these are scattered throughout the state. And we were very excited in 2014 uh, working on a power line project in Lincoln. Um, it crossed over our islands. Um, so I was up in there helping uh, the surveyors, uh, the archaeological firm that was doing the surveys for the, for the power company. And we were in Lincoln, Lincoln on the last day <laughs> after a week-long survey, and we found a small late paleo uh, campsite which is very exciting because I've never, never excavated one before. Um, so this is very exciting. So, and it was um, right here in the Penobscot River, um, which made it especially more exciting for me. Um, but within this small area, we had uh, just a, a nice, good sized fire hearth. There was calcine caribou bone around it, um, as well as lateral flaked uh, spearheads, um, which are, really peculiar to Maine um, compared to what we know as paleo Indian uh, spearheads being, you know, of the Clovis variety, they call it the fluted point variety. So we have lateral flaked uh, spearheads here as well. So our ancestors, you know, utilized significantly these, these important resources uh, here in Maine. Um, Mount Kineo being one lithic uh, source for materials, but within this paleo time period, a lot of Monsungan. So Monsungan Mountain is north of uh, Mount Katahdin. And it's the bright red material you see on the left-hand side. Um, and this is just a, a beautiful stone to work. Uh, and it produces razor sharp uh, spearheads, knives, bl other blades of, of that type. Um, and you can see the lateral flaking on on the uh, on the Monsungan itself on the red but you also we do have fluted material points here as well so um, fluting was utilized um, as well and for me uh, doing the research that I've been doing I you know looked up you know and found three different theories on why <clears throat> excuse me that the points were fluted one was obviously hafting um, the hafting technique to attach your spear shaft or, or bow shaft to the, uh, 
the stone itself. Um, another theory is um, it's a hunting magic. Um, we have here in the Northeast going up as far as, you know, Nascapi, Montanai, uh, up into the Dorset region where they, they have this hunting magic where if you can successfully make a spearhead and then successfully take out that center flute, which runs right down the middle um, of the stone itself without breaking it because there's a pressure flake and not striked flaked. Um, so when you pressure flake a perfect flute out of the center, you've put that good energy, that good, you know, that, that spirit is in there and, you know, you're, you're going to look to have a successful hunt. Um, another theory on um, that I kind of liked and enjoy is you really, you really think about it is, you know, I always envision with that center channel, it's a bloodletting device. Um, I always use the, the, uh, like the analogy of, you know, you're in a rainstorm and you see the rain just slowly going down the road. It just, you know, it's flat and it's meandering. But as soon as that wa rainwater gets into a gutter, it shoots fast, you know, it narrows in and it just shoots fast. So I, I look at that center channel in the flute, fluted point as the bloodletting. So all the blood gets into that channel and you bleed the animal faster, um, <clears throat> which makes less time. You know, you don't have to chase the animal as far. Um, and the animal bleeds out quicker and, and will die faster. But there also are another, uh, other very important tools in this, in this paleo period. Um, you know, burins are, are really, um, really useful. Um, burins are like perforators. So you're perforating hides um, for, to make clothing and possibly temporary shelters. Um, you're also using perforators, uh, you know, just to help uh, puncture holes in, in anything that you need. It could be bark, it could, you know, with uh, processing hides. Another important tool is the scrapers. Um, scrapers are used, um, they're unifaced, they're not biface. So biface is you're taking flakes from either side of the stone tool. So when you uniface it, you're only taking flakes off one side and it produces a razor sharp um, edge on it. And, and hence the name scrapers. You're scraping meat off bone, you're scraping fat off hides for processing hides, you're scraping bark off, off uh, you know, branches and whatnot to, for producing uh, spear shafts and, and bow and arrow shafts. Um, and then hand knives, you know, hand knives could be just a, a beautifully made modified flake. You know, you'd, if you're flaking away and you have this nice flat scallop shaped flake and you just gently biface it and you have a hand knife. And those are generally used, like what we know today is like a modern day ulu, um, you know, that the Inuit use for processing uh, the seals and walruses up north. We had them down here as well, um, where we used them for processing, uh, processing food and hides. And we do have those here in Maine as well. It's just a quick, I like this picture. It's just a quick little uh, image of what was known here in, in the Americas, North Central America. Um, these are the animals um, that lived here and roamed here. Uh, and I like this version because the artist who made this image put the shadow of a man in the right-hand corner to show how big these animals were that our ancestors were hunting uh, here in North America. Um, not all of them were in Maine, but we do have some significant sites here in Maine that contain mammoth, um, a lot of caribou sites, and the moose, the, the moose, some of the moose and caribou that the faunal remains that come out of these sites um, are large, like really robust bones, um, larger than what we know of today. Um, and we do have evidence of, um, which is very intriguing, that we do have mammoth sites here in Maine. So we transition, you know, as the landscape's changing, we're going, you know, the glaciers are retreating more so and more so. So the environment's really changing um, quickly. You know, I say very quickly, you know, it's a couple of thousand years, but that's a drop in the bucket, you know, over the time period. So as the environment's changing, we're leaving out of this tundra environment um, and getting into, you know, the trees are migrating across North America from the West and up from the South to the forests that we know of today. And then so adaptation really, 
we had to really adapt because a lot of these large megafauna animals were becoming extinct. They were, you know, due to kin groups, you know, the populations getting larger and hunting more, but as well as the environment. A lot of these um, paleo animals thrived on a paleo tundra um, environment. And once the, what we know today is the, the forests um, that we have here in Maine, there was no food. Um, and we do have some uh, origin stories of blue sky bay, like, like I mentioned earlier, slaying the last giant mammoth because um, um, he would not succumb to the will of blue sky bay's wishes. So you could utilize that um, as, as an origin story, but you know, extinction as well um, occurred just from lack of food, over hunting um, as well, like I said, as the kin groups get um, larger and larger. So adapting to this new environment was, was crucial for the survival of our ancestors. And a big part here in Maine was um, what we know as the maritime archaic. So, uh, you know, we're you, utilizing waterways, utilizing the ocean, going across the littoral of the Gulf of Maine, um, you know, and again, we're not entirely sure um, with the introduction um, of boating, but we know boating existed um, just due to what's being found in, in the very few remaining archaic sites, um, shell mound sites in Maine, where we're finding swordfish, um, porpoise, seal, um, a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, these maritime uh, fish, fish and game. Um, within these sites, as well as, you know, what I can, you know, everyone says the standards, you know, moose, bear, deer, um, that were um, found in, in the sites as well. But to, to, to go out and hunt swordfish, you needed a boat, you were out in the Gulf of Maine. And then during this time period, <clears throat> excuse me, where we are looking at that low stand um, after glaciation, where after the glaciers are gone, the land was depressed and it starts to rebound back up, the ocean falls back. Um, and it falls as far back as, you know, what we call the low stand. And that happened roughly between uh, nine, um, nine and nine, five years uh, BP um, <clears throat> with this low stand. So, and there's evidence of this low stand um, out in the Gulf of Maine where scallop, draggers, you know, the, the scallop fishermen and everyone else who, who ground fish like that are pulling up large, large stone tools, um, spearheads, ground stone tools um, out half mile up to a mile out from what we currently know as the edge, you know, the shoreline today. So you could go to the shoreline today and continue walking up to, up to another mile out, um, which is really, really astounding to think about. Um, and you can see it in some of the uh, LIDAR images, you know, sonar images of the Gulf of Maine, you know, where there was a shelf um, out there. Um, and that's where a lot of these, uh, you know, the stone tools are being found out uh, within, within the Gulf of Maine during that low stand. And again, with a few remaining uh, early, early sites that we have, um, we, we lost a lot of uh, these archaic sites due to sea level rise. You know, the glaciers are melting, putting all that fresh water worldwide. Globally, they're putting in that fresh water into the system, into the water system. And, you know, it's a natural occurrence. See, it's, you're going to have sea level rise during that time period. But again, these were, this is a nice, I like this image of the, uh, the fishermen out spear fishing uh, in the deep water. And a couple of, you know, like I said, in these archaic, uh, Shell mounds, we are finding direct evidence of swordfish and you know porpoise and seals. Um, and again, these mounds are have been depleted, one being washed away um, with the sea level rise due to storm surge, chewing out, um, just undercutting these, these ancient mounds um, that do provide a, a, a wealth of information um, within there. I've had the the opportunity and uh, pleasure to work on a couple of these archaic uh, mounds um, and it's just really really neat to to come across you know you you're looking at full 
swordfish swords, the bills of the of these swordfish within there. Um, some are decorated, some are just plain, some are made into harpoons um, and other tools. Uh, and it's a really dense, dense bone um, that our ancestors used. And you'd really need a strong stone to carve um, these, these really dense, dense bones. And I think that's where the rhyolite comes in because that's a dense rock. So you want something equally as dense so you're not chewing away a thin rock or, or a really malleable rock like Munsangen or, you know, uh, or these chirts that can get delicate when once made into a blade. But the kineo, when you make it into a blade, it really holds its own um, to, to modify uh, the swordfish uh, itself. Some more tools that were, were in this time period, we're still making the large spearheads uh, and blades and other blades like that. But we're looking during this archa archaic period, kin groups are getting larger. Uh, family units, you know, uh, populations, you know, it just, it's growing um, dramatically due to, you know, a new source uh, for, for food. You know, we're not just hunting and gathering, we're now fishing, we're getting into fishing um, and getting more, uh, getting more sedentary as well. So that means building houses. Um, and we look in, you know, at into new, new stone tools themselves, the technology is changing other than with the flake, we're getting into ground stone tools um, to where they're not pressure and hammer flaked. Um, they're more just pecked away. You're taking not a non-volcanic rock um, and you're just pecking it into shape and then you grind it to get these, these, uh, these beautiful tools like the gouges and the adds. Um, you know, you get that polish as you can see in that bottom gouge, um, beautiful polish in there. And then um, ground slate, um, which is primarily used, it's very delicate, ground slate is, but so it's primarily used a lot in, um, in a ceremony, more of a ceremonial use, but like the ads, um, and ads would be used like today's ax. So you could chop, you know, you're chopping down trees, you're chopping limbs and branches. Um, and then the gouge is used like today's modern day chisels. So you're working the wood, after, you know, you're processing the wood into whether it's dugout canoes, um, processing wood for um, spear shafts, for canoes, you know, birch bark canoes. Um, it's just a general woodworking tool. Um, another important tool during this maritime archaic is the plummet. Um, plummets are come in all shapes and sizes. Um, they're primarily used as fishing weights, net weights. So you, you would make a plummet the same way you'd make an adze or a gouge. Um, you're pecking it down and then kind of grinding it into a shape that desired shape that you want. And then you attach it to a net, um, whether they were making nets out of sinews, you know, the, the intestines of the, of their animals they're hunting. Um, some may have been reeds, um, woven reeds, but they're used as sinker weights. Um, and again, they come in all shapes and sizes, very large sizes. I've seen some plummets. Um, we have a, a, a couple here at the Penobscot Nation Museum. And uh, the Abbey Museum has a great collection of very large plummets. And I always envision those being too big, too heavy for nets themselves. They were possibly anchors, anchor weights um, for boats um, or sinkers um, for sinking, you know, like birch bark canoes, you, you sink them to keep them moist because um, you need that. You don't want your birch bark canoe to dry out and crack. So you'd want to keep it, keep it moist. But a whole host of, you know, um, other stone tools are coming in. So we're looking at a different kind, not a burin, but it's kind of a different kind of perforator. Um, it almost looks like a drill. Um, and we did uh, excavate a couple of those um, here along the Penobscot River, as well as up in, in the National Monument, um, to where they're used just like a hand drill, like today's, like a modern day hand drill. Um, and then the spearheads are getting smaller, you know, so we're looking at getting into that introduction to the bows and arrows. Um, here you can see in the center, there's, there's a, an Ulu style knife in the bottom of that. And then there's a couple of scrapers as well. Um, scrapers are one of those universal tools that go through all three time periods. And here we have uh, the use of the swordfish bills themselves. 
So like I said, you're making four shafts as well as the harpoons. Um, these again, really dense material and you need something really strong to puncture those fatty layers, especially to get through the scales of swordfish for one, um, but get to the really fatty layers of seals um, and the porpoises and the, and the other large animals that they were hunting out in the islands and out um, in the deep waters of Penobscot Bay. And these, these are just beautiful pieces here. And some are decorated and some are not. So during this maritime archaic, this archaic period here in Maine, uh, we have what we know as the red paint burial tradition. Um, it spans a lot of years, you know, um, and it's, it's a mortuary uh, ceremony. You know, our ancestors were buried with stone and bone tools um, with the intensive use of red ochre um, that can be found in numerous places within the Penobscot waters in the river shed itself. Um, I could just go up probably 10, 15 miles up river and find a source of red ochre um, from here. So it was really, really intensive, you know, and it's a ceremony that's um, continues today. Um, but we've had some, a little bit of confrontation with it, so to speak. Um, some early archeologists here in Maine discredit us um, as not being a part of the red paint tradition, um, which is not true um, in our eyes. Like with these archaic sites, you know, we bury our, our ancestors with this red paint tradition. How would we know to keep going back 5,000 years up until contact, just about contact with Europeans, we were still doing the red paint ceremonies. Um, and they were trying to say we were just not a part of that red paint tradition. The red paint people come in, they left. Susquehanna come in, they left. And then modern day Wabanaki come in um, as a different, totally different uh, group of people. And uh, in my eyes, uh, I'm just gonna be blunt, it's ridiculous. Um, we've been here. This is our home homeland. We still do red paint traditions. Um, I will say that uh, there are certain tribal families here in the Penobscot um, that still utilize the red paint tradition, uh, my family being one of them. I buried my father um, with the red paint tradition, with red paint, with his stone tools. Um, so it's continued on today. So, um, and it's great that, you know, this is, this is a really important tradition that needs to be kept alive because one, the stone tools were amazing. They're, they're beautifully crafted tools. Our ancestors were amazing uh, stone workers, you know, not with just the gouges, plummets and the ads, but what you see down in, um, in the lower left is what's described as Penobscot pendants. Um, some have theorized that these were used, these are ground slate pendants. Um, they can range from eight inches long up to three feet. Um, and some say that they were used as, as whetstones for, for sharpening stone tools. Um, but for me, I look at them at, as that, but I also look at them as um, markers. Some of them have incisions or design elements on them um, and they're perforated. So they were made for hanging. Um, and I always envisioned like our ancestors using these as markers. Um, you hang them in trees um, in certain areas to determine maybe kin groups, um, you know, as, as tallymen as well as I've heard them described. Um, but again, the ones that I've seen that have specific markings on them could be related to various families, to where you put your family's markings on these, on these, art, on these artifacts and you hang them in a tree, you know, as just maybe just north or south of your village site and whoever's coming up and down the rivers will see these hanging from the trees and, and can determine who, you know, who may be living in this area. Um, so it's just an interesting theory that I have with these. Um, and it's, and the, again, these are really delicate. Um, it's ground slate, they're really thin. Um, and I couldn't envision um, sharpening a, a stone tool with a three foot uh, quarter inch thick uh, slate uh, tool, but again, it's just one of my theories on how these are how these have uh, may have been used. So as we get into um, again, we're coming through these time periods, and 
villages are becoming larger, becoming more and more dependent on our riverine system um, with, you know, with the introductions to the, to the canoes. Um, village sites are becoming really large. You know, um, the forests are what we know today, how we see them, you know, pretty much how we see them today. And all along the Penobscot watershed, the village sites are large, um, going all the way <clears throat> down to the coast itself. Um, we do have direct evidence of very, very large village sites. Here, uh, Indian Island Old Town is, is one of them, um, to where we are still practicing that red paint tradition. Um, within our village sites, we do have red paint cemeteries um, that correlate with the timelines that um, we have here um, in Penobscot uh, territories here. By village sites up and along the river, some may be small, but like I said, here in Old Town was our main village site. And then you have scattered smaller sites out and about, which are, you know, family hunting and fishing territories. Um, each family went to their territories during season, you know, during the seasonality of whether you're hunting moose, whether you're um, fishing for alewife shad along the coast. Um, during, you know, during these different seasons, you know, everyone, a lot of archaeologists say here in Maine, it was summer on the coast, winter inland. Um, I do believe that, but some of the sites that I've worked on in along the coast, especially with the shell mounds, we do have winter sites there. So it's not just summer on the coast, winter inland. We do have winter sites uh, along the coast of Maine. And we know that through the evidence of, you know, the faunal materials. Um, that's one thing I really enjoyed um, working with as, you know, as an undergrad with my advisor, uh, mentor and friend, Brian Robinson is, he really got me interested in diets. Um, what, are, what were our ancestors eating, you know? Um, and so I, that's really, really uh, important information to not just archeology, span but just for us in general, you know, what were we eating, you know, 2000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 years ago. Um, it's really, really intriguing to me. And, and to find these, uh, these faunal remains in, in the shell mounds themselves is, is really exciting. Um, we don't get that so much inland um, where the, you know, we, Maine really has acidic soils. So anything carbon-based does not preserve well. Um, but when you get into the shell mounds along the coast, um, just about everything is preserved. We're finding, you know, bones, um, faunal remains, bone tools, uh, birch bark, um, which is really, really interesting, um, as, as well as the post molds themselves. So um, the post mold is, you know, evidence of where the poles of the wigwams were placed. Um, and in working with the uh, Abbey Museum on one of their last field schools um, at Tra Tranquility Farm, uh, we found really great evidence of post molds. And we were trying to determine how large these wigwams were, um, but we didn't have enough time, um, even though we were trying to piece them together. But it was really significant to see, um, you know, you, when you're excavating and you're just going, you know, unit by unit and you see this wigwam just forming all around. It's, it's just really, really awesome to see. And then you get to, you know, see what's inside, you know, um, inside each wigwam, as well as the mounds themselves on the outside. Um, a lot of people um, may in, in, interpret shell mounds as being, you know, like they're known as shell middens. Some people call them trash heaps, um, but they're not all trash. Uh, you know, there's a lot of vital information in that. Yes, they are discarded clams, scallops, um, you know, mussels, uh, sea urchins, um, oysters even. But it's not just waste. It's um, in there. There could be uh, burials. You know, some shell mounds along the coast of Maine are known as burial uh, places, and we have a number of those. You know, some of those that are left um, here in Maine that are significant. But there's also other elements in there. Um, you know, a really fun little story that I had is working down in Machias. Uh, didn't think anything was going to be in this section of the of the mound. It was really shallow, but then I came across a, a dog burial, um, which is really really neat to see. You know, I've never never encountered a dog burial before, so 
um, I always joke it was either a, a good dog as a pet or was a really good dog as dinner and was tossed into the shell mound itself. But it was just really interesting to see, um, you know, the mandible phalanges. Um, it wasn't fully articulated, which tells me that it wasn't a dog burial. It may have been dinner um, at some point. But right next to it were a couple of blades um, and a basalt adds, uh, which is just beautiful. Um, so that was really, really interesting site to work on down in there. So here's a, a small sample of woodland period stone tools. Again, we have the scrapers. Um, most of these tools, except for the Lavana triangles, um, came out of a site um, I worked with with the University of Maine uh, field school um, in Jones Cove. Um, and most of these come out of my units. Um, all the scrapers were all together, lined up perfectly, like they were just left right there, perfect. Um, and they were right near a small fire hearth with um, processing tools. Moose was being processed right there, that fire hearth. You had some cracked bone, you had some full complete bones um, with quartz wedges, scrapers right next to it. Um, so they were processing. And it was the interesting with that, that site and a lot of sites that I work on is, you know, it was just there, like it was just, set there and just left, which um, I know it wasn't, but it's just really neat to see all these artifacts around this fire hearth with the process, you know, you know they were processing moose bone right there at that fire. Um, and it was really, really exciting for me because in this section of the shell mound itself, we were in the undisturbed portions. It was originally excavated, um, I do believe with the Abbey Museum, uh, back in the 20s, um, where uh, a gentleman named uh, Moorhead, Warren Moorhead, came up uh, from Massachusetts and worked with Dr. Robert Abbey to excavate this site. And to see those old photographs when I was, we were doing the research uh, for this site was, was kind of amusing uh, in some capacity. Uh, you know, you see these, uh, these archaeologists sitting underneath their um, big umbrellas. And um, there's one with Moorhead and his wife sitting there uh, drinking something out of a bottle and then we ended up finding a bottle cap at the base of one of these middens uh so it was, we we always thought it was, just, it was you know just the archaeologist moorhead just throwing his bottle caps into the into the shell mound itself as they were working with it um techniques have come a long way with excavating um in these old photographs from jones cove they were using clam rakes they would just start at the edge of the water and just dig in um, with clam rakes and then just push the stuff behind them and just rebuilding the mound itself. Um, and they were only going for the trophies. They were just going for the large stone tools, maybe some really highly significant uh, bone tools as well as faunal remains. But we were mostly working in the back dirt, the already pre-disturbed areas that was excavated in the, in the twenties. And we found the extent of it. And then we, went up and worked into the undisturbed areas. And that just made it all more the exciting to, to work in an area, like I said, finding that fire hearth, which would have been destroyed by clam rakes. Um, but going back through their backfill at that time, uh, we knew a lot, of, you know, most of the, the tools are um, housed at the Abbey Museum. Um, so we know what they collected, but it's what they didn't collect was what we were very, very interested in. And that was diets. What were our ancestors eating in uh, Gouldsboro, you know, in, down in Frenchman Bay, um, as well as some significant um, items that they missed. You know, a lot of, a lot of arrowheads, uh, a lot of bifaces, a lot of scrapers um, and the faunal. Uh, you know, one of the big ones that we did find, which I don't know how they overlooked was um, a bear mandible, um, remnants of like, bear you know is, is is really exciting to see a fully intact mandible of a bear that i'm surprised they didn't grab at that time but again this it's really exciting um for this period we're still making the large stone tools ground stone tools are still in use as well coming from the archaic so we're so we're getting this um you know we're continuing on the tradition of a lot of these but here in maine um with when the bow and arrow comes in um, we have a distinct 
boundary line, which is really, really neat. And um, like I said, my, my mentor and advisor, good friend, Brian Robinson was working on this um, late in his career before he passed is what made this cultural boundary. Um, and it basically stems at the Kennebec River. So um, when you go north and east of the Kennebec River, we're getting into these side and corner notch points um, as far as arrows. But when you get to the south and west and start heading into southern New England, these Levana triangles appear. Um, even though they were on both sides, but the concentrations were on either side, both east and west of the Kennebec River, which is really, really important um, to him. You know, he's really wanted to know why. Um, and with these Levana triangles, uh, you see them going down into southern New England as well. Um, but they have variations on them. Some will have um, stems. So like you see in the side and corner notch, the stem is the base where the notches are. So some of these Levanas um, turn into, they turn into what they call uh, Jack's Reef. Um, it's a type of projectile point that it's a Levana triangle with a stem. And um, that's, that's found down in um, like Mer uh, Merrimack River area down into uh, Cape Cod and, and those areas like that. Um, and working with other archeologists and, and uh, historic preservation offices down in that area, um, they were saying that these, these Levana triangle points um, are replicating shark's teeth. Um, and you see them by the, the hundreds in some sites, and they do look like little shark's teeth, you know, and, you know, and sharks are known in Southern New England, um, especially down, you know, in Martha's Vineyard area, working with the Aquino Wampanoags, um, they have, you know, significant sites where there are shark's teeth, actual shark's teeth in the site, and they have the, these, the Jack's Reef uh, projectile points next to them, and they're almost identical. So it's really, really neat. Um, you know, and that's just an area that I'd really like to, to learn more about, um, but my main focus is still here in Maine. So a side project, I may work with some friends down at, uh, down at Aquina to learn more about uh, their, their traditions on making stone tools. Um, as, as you know, alongside with us up in here. So in this woodland period, bone tool technology really takes off. Um, the archaic, definitely we're using bones, you know, like I said, with the swordfish, with the harpoons um, and whatnots, but this, this woodland period bone tool production is immense. Um, and as an undergrad, you know, working uh, with the University of Maine Field School, um, I spent my whole spring break at the Abbey Museum <laughs> just looking and counting at bone tools because um, that was my under, under, undergrad uh, thesis project, so to speak, was bone tool production uh, in Frenchman Bay. And the Abbey has an immaculate collection of um, from the site that I worked on, Jones Cove, just a phenomenal collection of bone tools and they're, they, they're wide ranging. You know, you go from what they call simple bone points um, to larger bone points um, of, you know, up to, um, I don't know, six, seven inches long. And then harpoons, not just swordfish, but just, you know, moose bone harpoons, um, other faunal animals used to make some bone, bone points, bone tools, fish hooks, um, and again, miniatures. Um, we did end up in 2006 when I was working on the field school, we we're excavating Jones Cove and we came across a miniature harpoon. It was no, no larger than an inch long. So I don't know if it was a little, someone who was just, you know, one of our ancestors was playing around, you know, we just called it a miniature uh, toy. Um, my advisor called it a, a toy harpoon. You know, it could have been just someone just fiddling around. Um, after dinner. But for me, the bone tool production was um, exciting. It's like, why? Why were there so many simple bone points of all shapes, sizes? Some were marked, um, some had ridges, notches cut into them, some were decorated. Um, you know, and there's a number of theories with those, um, with just the simple bone points themselves. You know, harpoons have a specific purpose, awls have a specific purpose. Um, but these simple bone points, you know, what were they used for? So, you know, so a couple of the theories that I was running with was um, 
used as at the end of fishing spears, Leicester spears. Um, you don't want a stone tool. If you're, if you're ground fishing, you're plunging your Leicester spear into the water and you hit a rock. If you hit rock on rock, you're going to break your center spear, uh, your center point uh, in the spear itself. And then you'd have to, you know, travel back up to Mount Kineo, get the stone, travel all the way back home, make again, make the spear itself again um, with bone. Um, you know, it's time consuming that way. But with bone, if you put it into the water and you break the bone point, you know, you basically you just got to eat dinner. You know, you're having leg of moose for dinner. And after dinner, you can just crack the bone, make another bone point uh, right there after dinner. While the bone is fresh, you can carve out another one with your stone tool. Um, but again, it doesn't explain the, the number uh, and the scope of, of how many of these were in there. there hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, just in one site alone. Um, and then doing further research, you know, moving across into Penobscot Bay, immense collections of bone points um, within these sites. Um, so they, they definitely have a, another purpose, but for me, it's, it's that fishing aspect. Um, whether, you, you know, again, whether you're ground fishing, spear fishing um, with your Leicester spear, were they used for shucking open clams? You know, it's another theory, um, you know, for harvesting, you know, opening up uh, clams, mussels um, to get to, you know, to get to the, the animal itself for, for boiling and whatnot. Um, and another theory that um, I thought of is, um, were they gaming pieces, um, you know? Um, used in like uh, out west, I use the analogy like out west. Um, uh, they they have this they call them stick games and whatnot, where it's a gambling game. You have to guess, you know, the songs and and everything that goes along with it, and you got to guess. You know, uh, the premise that I got from watching it is, you know, who's holding what, you know, and which markings are on it. So, um, and then you got to guess and you gamble on whether you're going to be right or wrong. Um, so, were those used here? You know, this. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, our ancestors had a lot of free time on our hands, but, you know, when you're in a storm, you know, and again, we're looking at the Jones Cove site is a late winter site. Um, and you're in your wigwams quite a bit during the winter, you know, are they gaming pieces, you know, um, whether it's with adults or with kids, you know, are they, you know, are they just um, fun little games that, that are there? Cause again, a lot of them have distinct markings on them. Um, from, from Jones Cove, as well as other sites like Harbor Island, uh, Neskeg Point and all that. Um, this really, really, really interesting designs um, as well as notchings on them. So they could be gaming pieces as a theory I threw out um, as well um, in my uh, undergrad research. And my professor was like, uh, I don't know. But then he thought about it and he was like, well, maybe, you know, but um, it was just really interesting conversations that I had with him about that theory on, on that use. And during this woodland period, ceramic really uh, comes up. You know, woodland period also is known as a ceramic period here in Maine. Um, you know, and pottery is being introduced um, coming up. Um, we believe, you know, from the south and from the west, and a lot of the pottery here in Maine was made from this very fine marine clay called the Brazumscot Formation. And it's this beautiful gray uh, clay, super rich. Um, and then, you know, pottery was made um, for cooking, for storage. Um, you know, you got cooking vessels, you have storage vessels. Um, a lot of them are, in, in, you know, patterned like this. You know, you get cord wrap stick pattern, patterning, um, corded paddle, um, as well as um, some are just plain. You know, some, some of these pots were just plain too. You just find plain pieces. But um, a lot of pottery in a lot of these sites um, up and down the coast of Maine, as well as up into the Penobscot River watershed. Um, and within the Penobscot River watershed is really highly concentrated with this marine clay. Um, doing surveys, when I do surveys on our, on our territories and the islands, I don't go down very far until I'm hitting that marine clay. Um, and then that's, <laughs> and it's great, great resource. So we're hoping to, uh, um, get a couple of people together. I'd like to revitalize some clay making, you know, you using our own clay, you know, getting the shell temper or, or the 
crushed raw, you know, the crushed granite tempers to, to make these pots. But it'd be really neat to, um, to, to revitalize um, pottery making uh, in the old way, like this, like our ancestors did uh, here within our community. And fishing. Definitely fishing in this in this time period is, is huge. Like I said, a lot of these mounds, they're made up of clams, oysters, urchins, mussels. Um, but the fish that we're finding, like again, these late uh, late winter, early spring fish, spring fish like shad, alewife, tomcod um, coming in. Tomcods are chasing the shad and alewives coming in to spawn in the spring. Um, and a lot of the middens that I've worked on, tomcod and uh, shad and sturgeon are abundant um, within these mounds. And here is an artist's depiction of what uh, a fishing net weir would look like, as well as a, a real weir itself in an intertidal weir um, made from rocks. Um, and then you use the netting around that as well. You know, you build it up as the tide comes in, as the tide's going out, fish get trapped behind it, um, behind the rocks themselves, as well as the nets. And here we have, um, you know, evidence in the Penobscot River of, of weirs themselves. Um, one up in, in the, in the Pasadumkeg region, you know, we, we firmly believe that there are still weirs that, are, that have not been moved or shifted by ice. Um, and I believe I also found one up further um, in the Katahdin Woods and Waters region, a fish weir that was used during uh, high water, low water areas in the Savoy's, uh, Savoy's River. Um, which we're going to go back up and take a look at next next summer uh, when we continue our field work up in there. Um, but again, I, I like this rendition of the artist rendition of netting fish, drying fish, you know, you're smoking your fish. Um, and it's just, it shows kin groups working together, you know, families working together to harvest for the village. You know, you may or may not be harvesting just for your family. You may be harvesting to sustain your whole your whole village site. And agriculture comes up again from the south and from the west. Um, we have evidence of that. It was really big in the Mississippi River uh, areas coming up from the southwest with the corn um, and the squash, especially. You know, corn, um, some of the earliest evidence of corn is down in the Mexico, uh, Central America region, where it was just no bigger than like your finger, you know, this little tio sente. Uh, and they just modified by by humans. You know, you take the largest kernel off it, plant it. Take the largest kernel, plant it. So it's just, you know, modified uh, in that capacity, you know, without uh, today's Monsanto modifications. Um, so it's, you know, it's, and it was brought up through and it was introduced up into here. Um, it wasn't as intense um, as it was along the southern and western uh, regions of the United States. But we did have agriculture up here in Maine. We do have evidence of, of that as well. And then we come up into contact um, where we have, uh, you know, the three G's, gods, guns, and germs um, that were introduced to us. And um, which is really neat. You know, some of these early, early sites, um, contact period sites are, are really interesting. You know, and we worked on one in Machias with the University of Maine Field School. And in, in the shell mound itself, we had stone, you know, evidence of stone tools, bone tools, but right next to uh, an array of lithic debris, of stone debris, we found a brass crucifix, brass beads, brass tacks, um, lead glazed pottery, um, you know, French, French pottery, you know, ceramics, um, a chamber pot even. But it was just really, really interesting to see, you know, and my advisor uh, thought that maybe we may have stumbled on a possible trading post um, with that, you know, with the stone and bone tools and then having the crucifix right there, um, which is really, really interesting. It was just, it really astounded all of us. We were just like, whoa, this is, this is really neat, um, you know, to find that element within a shell mound itself. And we see all these elements today, you know, we still continue on our traditions um, today, whether it's, you know, stone tool making, like, you know, I do flint napping. A lot of the songs and ceremonies, basket making, birch bark canoes we're still building, um, but we do it with a modern modern day uh, essence mixed into it as well. So 
I'm going to transition real quick. I know we're getting on time, and I do want to leave some time for questions and answers um, at the end. Um, but I just want to go through with our collaboration with the Penobscot Nation Tribal Historic Preservation Office, um, working with the National Park Service since the, in, you know, uh, when it was proclaimed to be a national monument in 2016, uh, Penobscot Nation has been working very closely with the National Park Service itself um, within the monument because it is within our traditional homeland. It's, you know, the Penobscot River runs right through the center of the monument. Um, so we really had a vested interest in this, especially me um, being an avid canoeist, you know, kind of going paddling that river um, quite a bit. I really want to know more about it. And so when the proclamation came about um, in 2017, 2016, we immediately started archeological work um, in 2017 um, is when the work really, really took off um, with that. <clears throat> So we initially started with what we know. Um, just like any archeological uh, survey, you do the research and find what's already been done, what's already known. Um, so we did that, we did the initial uh, survey of surveys, uh, so to speak. So we found where the existing sites were and then looking at the landscape itself, could, could we identify potential future sites um, in that which we have? Um, and it's great, you know, this is the, the fun side, I guess, of archaeology is, you know, especially in the monument, you can get out in a canoe and you really can't hike to certain places. There's no trails. So you use uh, what our ancestors used, Penobscot River, you know, as a highway. Um, so a lot of sites that we got to, we had to get to uh, via canoe. Other times we did hike. Um, and then some sites you can drive into. Uh, but this is much more fun. I'd rather... Uh, paddle four or five miles then hike uh, four or five miles myself. But working with them, it's been a great experience. You know, working with Region 1 um, archaeology, uh, it's, it's been a great experience working with them. Um, very knowledgeable staff, very enthusiastic, really wanting to, you know, to, to work with the Penobscot Nation within this. Um, and, and the archaeologist James Nyman is one of the, one of the best. He's, he's a really, really good guy, and he's really excited and enthusiastic about working in the monument as well. And um, we've done a lot of work in there. And some of our earliest work um, that we did was at uh, Lungsu, uh, Lungsu camps. And we did a couple of surveys. Um, we know there's a site just south and we know there's a site just north. Um, so we wanted to just take a look at, you know, some areas in, this, in the center. Um, and Lungsu was very, very, um, very exciting. You know, we didn't think we we're going to find all that much because, you know, we thought it was just a floodplain. Um, but we ended up finding, a, you know, some debitage of, of tool making. But then this drill appeared. Um, we ended up finding remnants of a, of a drill, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and then, at, you know, in other spots that we worked at um, uh, along the monument itself, you know, the Savoy's area. Um, going up um, to what we call the Little Elbow, another site, and we and it's a collaborative effort, not just with Penobscot Nation and the National Park Service. Uh, we we work with um, Elliottsville Foundation, uh, members of, of Elliottsville Foundation, as well as local historian um, and an all around great guy, uh, Eric Hendrickson. Um, this guy can get you lost real quick and you can get out of the woods real quick with him. He likes to take off the beaten trail. He goes, oh, I know a campsite, follow me. And we'll leave the trail and walk about up to a half mile, just blazing a trail through the woods um, and stumble upon a campsite that he found. And we're talking historic campsites, uh, logging campsites, maybe hunting uh, campsites and whatnot. But it's just it's always exciting to go in the woods with him and his wife, Elaine, um, cause you never know where you're going to go and you don't know what you're going to see. Um, so it's very exciting. And here's a couple of shots of all of us working together over the last couple of years. Um, up top is the Savoyce area. Um, down below we're at Orin Falls, which is very exciting on the Wasatiquit, uh, Wasatiquit stream that flows into the Penobscot. And then another area we are at, we are in the Savoyce area down below as well. Um, going down to the Savoyce river itself. 
But again, this has been a great, great relationship. So, and we produce these maps out of the work we've been doing um, with the Park Service. Um, the black outlines are the monument uh, boundary itself and we're showing um, a lot of the lithics that we've been finding within the park itself. These are the source sources of them. We found, you know, Mansungan uh, tools along, you know, along the East Branch, Wasadequit Formation is this beautiful black chert um, that runs, you can see it runs from where the arrow points. If you follow that pink boundary all the way up, um, that's that's the bane of the Wasadequit Formation. It's beautiful. Um, Mansungan is, is nice, red um, with green and black swirls. Um, it's also black with gray banding in it. Traveler Mountain, just outside boundary lines, um, but Traveler Rhyolite is a really nice durable stone, again, like Mount Kineo, but Traveler's, instead of Kineo's green with like white phenocris, where Traveler's Mountain is gray with uh, black and black and gray phenocris. The phenocris are the little crystallines that, that are in the, in the stone itself. Um, but again, these are just some important source areas of where we harvested stones. You know, I call it harvesting stone, gathering stones for, for stone tool making. Um, and the conglomerates up, up north in the, in, by uh, Haskell Rock, Haskell Deadwater are amazing. It's uh, this, this, especially Haskell Rock. The conglomerate is, you know, it's just a bunch of stones mashed together during, you know, volcanic activity. And when it cooled, you have this really cool, you know, it's like, like granite. You have all these different elements, rock elements and minerals within it. But these conglomerates are huge. You, you're getting chunks of uh, Wasadequa, chunks of Mansungan, you know, the size of your fingernail, uh, you know, a thumbnail um, in amongst the, you know, the underlying, it, the bedrock itself. Um, and these are just, uh, this is a quick highlight of some of the areas um, where we have uh, found some stone tools. Not all these have been excavated. Some of these are random finds. Um, like, you know, you, you're surveying the shoreline, um, you know, just walking along the shorelines at low water. Um, but we have um, these very, very nice, beautiful stone tools um, going back into the archaic, you know, archaic time periods. Um, and there's still so much more to explore. Um, up in there we've barely scratched the surface um on what we're you know what potential the monument has for archaeology so um really excited to uh, pass our knowledge on to the next generation on who's gonna you know come in and and uh take over after we're uh after we're retired so to speak but so these are some of the uh tools that we're we did find within uh the monument area um, that's that Wasadequit formation. That's a bl nice black, creamy, creamy uh, stone. Um, we found the preform Kineo. That's the Traveler's Mountain drill from Lungsu. Um, and then a ground slate Ulu hand knife. Um, I actually found just outside of the monument boundaries. Uh, I was kayaking one day, pulled over just to take a quick break. I looked down and there was sticking, the blade was sticking up out of the mud. Um, and it's a perfectly just ground slate with one little notch, flaked notch taken out of it. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful blade. Uh, and that's in the uh, Tippo collection here at Penobscot Nation. Um, all the other artifacts that are, are found within the monument itself, um, we do have access to, but they are being um, held, you know, at the, at region one uh, uh, national park service, you know, in their database. So it's been a real honor to, to work with the Park Service. You know, like I said, we have so much more to explore um, within the monument itself. And it's just a beautiful area to work in. Like I said, you know, you could spend a day right there at Lungsu itself, um, just hanging out, paddling it up and down. Um, but just the, the views up in there and the work we've done over the last five years has been really, really a, a good thing, you know, and we're still finding like this year we found a new site um, in the Haskell Deadwater area. Um, last year when I was up there working with the Ways uh, Science Camp, we found a cache of flakes, uh, Munsungan flakes, nice bright red flakes um, along the beach 
little mini beach along the East Branch. And this year, you know, I took GPS and then uh, let James Nyman know, hey, we need to get up there. I want to do some test units. So we went up this year, this summer, and did a couple of test units. And we believe we found a site. Um, so we found, you know, more stone tools, um, Munsungan tools, um, as well as, you know, flakes and as well as logging tools <laughs> within the within the thing. Right at the top, as we're excavating our unit, you get we got a nice logging um, pike stick, the pike, metal pike for um, pushing logs. And then underneath it is when we fi started finding the stone tools. Um, but it all stemmed, you know, just from seeing a, a handful of flakes along the beach to where we now have a new site. So, um, we registered it within the monument itself, within the National Park Service, as well as we're going to uh, register it with the state of Maine, you know, um, for their records, you know, the Maine Historic Preservation Commission as well, as well as the tribal Penobscot Tribal Historic Preservation. Um, so a nice collaborative effort, again, working not just the tribe and the National Park Service, but we were involving you know, the Ways Science Camp, the Wabanaki Youth Science Camp, um, working with Maine Historic Preservation, um, working with local historians, um, local naturalists, you know. So we're not just looking at archaeology, we're looking at the whole ethnographic outlook of the Katahdin Woods and Waters, you know, uh, looking at uh, everything from what plants were considered food and medicine, um, fish, wildlife, geology, um, and then just combining that all together and our end product will be um, a report um, on that. And I'm not sure how long the report's gonna be. It could be 10 pages, it could be 300 pages. We don't know yet. Um, we're just beginning to start that. Um, and I'm very excited to be working on that project as well. And I do believe that is what I have. I guess I could take any questions now. I don't know if Star is. I'm still here. <laughs> coming back to join us. <laughs> okay, hang on, hang on. All right, go ahead. Um, so we did have a couple of really great questions that I want to make sure that um, we get to. Uh, sure. and the first is uh, coming from a really good friend of the Abbey, Dwayne Toma. Um, are Wabanaki languages used to identify tools and items? Yes, that's what I'm working with our language. Um, language speakers here on trying to, you know, what is the name of this tool? You know, what, like, what am I doing? Like when I strike a rock to, to make the tool, what is that action? What do they call that? You know, so um, I am working with, within our department, within the culture department itself, we are um, working on trying to develop that as well. Um, we do want to do it like a short video of me flint napping and then having someone speak, you know, he is doing this, or this is what, this is, you know, this is what the stone is, what the leather, um, yeah, yeah. And following up on that, has it given you any insights into um, the tools or tool making? As far as working yes. or ma making tools? Yeah, or, or just the um, thinking and reflecting on the importance of the tools for, for the ancestors and um, thinking about um, maybe if like the languages could uh, reveal any of like uh, uh, deeper connections to the tools? It could, I believe it could. Yeah. Um, but like for me with flint napping, um, I always like, like seeing other pieces. I go to museums or whatever, you know, other museums and whatnot and I see tools and I'd be like, oh, I, I wanna replicate that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I get excited about that, you know? So when I see like a stone tool that I really wanna make, I'll take a picture of it and I'll try to replicate it as best I can, or a bone tool, you know, just try to try to replicate that. I know I got um, six moose legs in a deep freezer right now, ready to get, <laughs> ready to get cracked to make some bone tools. Um, so I'm excited about that. So I may hopefully start that over the winter on doing some bone tool production. Um, but I always like seeing other, other tools, you know, tool forms, whether it's a, a you know, a spearhead, arrowhead, um, I attempted to make a plummet once and I got frustrated because I broke it <laughs> in the pecking process. Uh, and I haven't started again, but I also tried to start to do a gouge. Um, but just that constant percussion, the pecking percussion of stone on stone, 
really uh, did a number on my wrists and forearms. Um, so, you know, our, our ancestors must have been like, you know, hulks or Popeyes, I call them. Because, you know, I mean, their forearms, it was almost like after a week of it, I was just like so sore. But doing it every day, you know, I'm sure that would, you build up that stamina. But just for an average standard person trying to do that, uh, you know. But again, I always like to see other artifacts and try to replicate them as best I can. Um, we have another question. Um, who has exclusive authority over sacred items and ancestral remains and what efforts are being done to return these, uh, presumably this person means from like collecting institutions? Um, well, everything goes through the National Park Service NAGPRA. So each tribe has the ability um, to make claims of sacred items, funerary objects, ancestral remains, um, you know, and you, the museum or institution has to register those items within the National Park Service Department of Interior under the Native American Graves uh, Protection, you know, the Protection Act, the law. Um, but here in, the, in Maine and New Brunswick areas, you know, we have the Wabanaki Repatriation Committee. So all four tribes come together to work together collaboratively. Um, and that makes, I believe that makes us a stronger entity to, to go after these claims um, on repatriation, on bringing them home. But it is a law that institutions, if they're federally funded, they have to comply with NAGPRA laws. Um, other institutions that aren't federally funded, um, I've dealt with personally, um, and they want to return these items in good faith. So we've had ancestral human remains and funerary objects returned from certain museums and institutions, historic centers, like historical societies, where they were like, we feel like we don't, we shouldn't have these in there. We want to return them to you. So um, we'll, we'll collectively take them back um, and um, do our reburial ceremonies. Here's another question. Um, does spirituality play a role in how you conduct your archaeological work? Um, yeah, it does to a certain degree. Um, I usually say, you know, I always I have that mindset where um, I being an indigenous archaeology archaeologist is you have to walk that fine line. Like I, I walk a fine, I feel like I walk a fine line between tradition and science. You know, and sometimes they mix together well, and sometimes they don't want to mix together at all. <laughs> you know, you do what do a do you believe the origin creation stories or do you believe the true science? You know, and that's been the debate for a long time. Um, but I think you know, in indigenous archaeology is is meshing those two together. You know, like what I do. You know, I look at our origin stories, look at the landscapes, and then see different aspects of it and blend them together. You know, and a lot of, not a lot, but many archae older archaeologists from, um, you know, a generation ahead of me are starting to really see that as well, you know, where they're like, no, 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 you can't, you can't base science on a creation story. But now they're looking at it going, well, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, now this makes sense. You know, and I can name a handful of archaeologists that I work with today that have come around and said, whoa. You know, why didn't, why weren't we looking at that before? And you're just like, well, you never asked. You always just assumed you knew everything and we didn't, you know, and that's how I explain it to, to some people. It's like, you know, older, the older generation archeologists knew everything about Native Americans and, and we didn't know anything about our own culture and history, you know, with the stone tools, but um, now it's meshing together, you know, and it's, and it's, it's a really interesting concept. And, um, it's not quite decolonizing archaeology, but it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you still need the science in there. You know, um, the 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 science that goes along with you know with the archaeology. Um, but it's a it's a nice collaborative effort now. I think you know, and there's more and more indigenous archaeologists coming up, not just here in the Northeast, but across the country, across the world. Indigenous archaeologists are doing their own archaeology. You know. I'm hearing stories, you know, with with Maori, with the Aborigines down in New, uh, Australia, doing their own archaeology away from institutionalized archaeology. Yeah. 
And it's great to see, you know, and I'm, I'm always encouraging our next generation to get in. You want to get into archaeology. Look how much fun I'm having. <laughs> Another question. It says, I'm curious about the eastern boundary of Penobscot territory. Does the archaeological record reveal anything about cultural distinctions among Wabanaki peoples? Hmm. That's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say there's no distinct boundaries. Um, there's a lot of similarities between stone tools. So like from Penobscot River, you know, or you go over to the Kennebec River or you go to Passamaquoddy Bay, you know, a lot of the stone tools are gonna to be similar, you know, but it's all in the family kin groups and, you know, who knew whose boundaries? You know I mean? We knew like if we were going too far East or North, you know, encountering other groups of people, you know, whether it's Passamaquoddy, Malisey, you know, or Micmac or going west, you know, and down south towards, you know, Abenaki and down into, you know, Wampanoag territory, you know. Um, so there's really no discern, discernible boundaries per se. It's just you knew you were going into other other groups' territories um, um, through interactions, you know, and, and then there's a lot of boundaries that are mixed. You know, there were some shared boundaries, I do believe, um, you know, that goes along with a lot of you know, intermarrying between tribes, communities, um, and whatnot. But there's no distinct boundary. No, I would I would say there's a definitive boundary. I mean, there's no definitive boundary between here and Canada. There really isn't. It, it was you know that's that's uh, Eurocentric. Um, this is actually a very similar uh, question. This person is also interested in understanding um, how far north and south. Um, uh, the reach of traditional uh, Penobscot territory is, and um, he writes that he also recognizes that glaciers played a big role from your presentation and like the retreating glaciers maybe in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, to my understanding, you know, Penobscot traditional territory, you know, is within the Penobscot watershed itself. Going over my family, the Sokalexis family, our traditional hunting and fishing territory was Moosehead Lake region. Um, and then we also had families that were going up into the Allagash. So um, extending up into the into that area as well. Um, and we've always looked at that being a part of it doesn't even though it doesn't flow north south, like, you know, the main stem, um, you know, the Allagash flows north. But um, we've always looked at that as being a part of the Penobscot watershed. Um, flowing out of, you know, coming out of Chisong Cook area um, and then flowing north instead of flowing south like the West Branch. Um, so it, for us, you know, we do look at the traditional territories going up into the Allagash um, down to the coast and as far west as Moosehead Lake. But then you got to think of all the tributaries that come in, um, hooking up to the Kennebec River, you know, so <laughs> it's really hard to, to discern, but, um, you know, we have a general idea of what the traditional territories were. All right, so that's it, Chris, for today. Thank you so much for being with us and oh. uh, for doing this presentation. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I just wanna thank everybody in the audience for being with us today. Um, this presentation will be in, uh, available later. Um, and I encourage you to check out the rest of our presentations that we have available on our YouTube page. So visit us at abbeymuseum.org for more information. And definitely check out our YouTube page for all past presentations as well. Definitely. <laughs> all right. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>